Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly series all about geometry processing, which aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting out research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. Sorry about that. Uh, today, we're thrilled to have Rohan Sani as our opener to talk about Monte Carlo geometry processing, and Mirella Benchem to discuss her research on shape correspondence. You can leave all your questions in the YouTube chat, and we encourage you to do, to do that as you come up with these questions instead of at the end, as traditionally you would do on a talk, uh, so that we can curate the best Q&A session at the end of both talks. So let's begin by welcoming our opener speaking. Uh, Rohan Sahni is a computer science PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University, advised by Professor Keenan Crane. Previously, he re received a bachelor's in physics and computer science at Columbia University. And he's also a recipient of the Carnegie Mellon Graduate Presidential Scholarship, which sounds pretty fancy to me. I first knew of Rohan because of his amazing work on boundary first flattening, which earned him the SGP Software Award last year. Not happy with this, he had an absolutely stunning paper published in SIGGRAPH this year on Monte Carlo geometry processing. And I'm happy to report this is exactly what he will be telling us about today. You can take it away now, Ron. Sure. Okay, so just give me a second. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Great. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about how replacing finite element methods with Monte Carlo methods in geometry processing can really help address a lot of the long-standing challenges in the field. Uh, oops. Sorry, guys, give me a second. Okay. So in recent years, geometry processing has really built on top of partial differential equations for basically all sorts of tasks, ranging from robust geometric queries to field-based remeshing. And common to a lot of these applications is that at some point you have to solve a PDE of the form LU equals F, where L is some kind of differential operator. But to do this, there's one big problem that you have to deal with first. And this is the problem of finite element mesh generation, basically taking your domain and breaking it up into small computational elements. And actually this strategy of solving PDEs is how photorealistic rendering used to be done in the late 80s and early 90s when finite element radiosity was the method of choice. But the biggest pain point in solving PDEs this way is in first producing a high quality mesh. Uh, real world geometric data has defects that makes it really hard to mesh and meshing itself is quite delicate because just a few bad elements can cause robustness problems for downstream applications. Traditional PDE solvers have other challenges as well. Um, so no matter what kind of method you use, you'll end up having spatial discretization error. There's also approximation error because you're replacing your true function space with a finite dimensional subspace. And you also need to solve large global systems of equations, even if you're only interested in seeing the solution in a specific region. And so for all of these reasons, um, in rendering people said, well, maybe there's another way. Maybe Monte Carlo methods can help us overcome a lot of these challenges. And in fact, ray tracing doesn't require any high quality meshing or solving of global systems. The only geometric thing you need to be able to do is to intersect your scene with a ray. And actually it's precisely for this reason that Monte Carlo methods in rendering are very robust to bad geometry. Even if your mesh is horrible, you end up getting renderings that don't look very different from what you'd get if you had a nice mesh. In geometry processing, however, people have taken a somewhat different approach, um, which is basically making meshing algorithms more robust. Now, this is a perfectly valid approach, but this sort of robust meshing comes at a cost. Uh, these algorithms often end up eliminating important geometric detail uh, that can change qualitative features of your solution. And their performance can also be unpredict unpredictable, uh, especially on models that are geometrically simple, but badly triangulated. And in general, meshing really is the bottleneck in finite element methods. So for example, with this model, it takes 14 hours just to generate the mesh while the finite element solve takes just a couple of minutes. And so for all of these reasons, we're really excited to be presenting a new approach to geometry processing based on grid-free Monte Carlo methods. At a high level, our technique replaces recursive ray tracing and rendering with recursive random walks for geometry processing. 
And from a geometric perspective, we replace ray intersection queries with closest point queries, which allows us to tackle problems without any mesh generation. We also inherit a lot of the usual benefits from Monte Carlo you find in rendering. So for instance, now all of a sudden you can do geometry processing, not just on polygonal meshes, but also things like implicit surfaces. We can also do robust booleans be between different geometric representations and work directly with low quality geometry. Um, and this is like Monte Carlo rendering where the quality of the solution degrades pretty gracefully with the quality of the input domain. From a computational view viewpoint, uh, we only need to build bounding volume hierarchies, which can be done really quickly and without much memory. And from an architecture perspective, um, Monte Carlo methods really do make a lot of sense because relative to FEM, they're trivial to parallelize. We can also do adaptive sampling to concentrate sampling effort in regions with high frequency or only in the regions we care about. And again, this is like ray tracing because we focus effort on what the camera sees and don't compute global solutions. Finally, since there's no discretization of function spaces or space or time, uh, grid-free Monte Carlo methods actually make pretty reliable black box solvers, even in current geometry processing pipelines. Okay, now all of this said, I should say that Monte Carlo methods are not a silver bullet. Right? Finite element solvers are very mature and pretty fast. So if you have a fairly simple domain with smooth boundary conditions, then finite elements might be the preferable approach. Also, Monte, Car Monte Carlo methods, also, uh, of course, introduce noise, uh, but we'll talk a little bit later about how to deal with this. Finally, specifically in this, in, in this paper, we specifically focused on second order linear diffusive equations in volumetric domains. So things like the Laplace and Poisson equation. But in the future, there really are a lot of opportunities to take expertise from areas like rendering, stochastic control, and mathematical finance to generalize this framework to a larger setting. Okay, so now let me talk about how all of this works. So I'll start with a basic and fundamental PDE in geometry processing that we often want to solve, the Laplace equation. Uh, the solutions to this equation are known as harmonic functions, and essentially they smoothly interpolate the boundary data G into the interior of the domain. We'll consider two complementary viewpoints uh, of these functions or characterizations of these functions derived using potential theory and stochastic calculus uh, to motivate the basic algorithm we use. So the mean value property of harmonic functions tells us that the solution at any point x is just the average value of the solution over any empty ball centered at x. Here, the unknown quantity u is an integral over u itself. And so kind of like Kajaya's rendering equation, this too is a recursive integral equation. On the other hand, uh, Kakutani's principle tells us that the solution of a Laplace equation can be expressed as the expected value of g where a random walk first hits the boundary. Now, clearly you don't want to simulate a detailed random walk like this because it's really expensive. So instead notice that by symmetry, a random walk starting at x is equally likely to exit at any point on the sphere centered on x, irrespective of what it does inside the sphere. And so as a result, the expected value that we had on the previous slide, but now inside the ball, can be rewritten as the mean value principle we had before. And in fact, this motivates a Muller's so-called walk on spheres algorithm, which basically recursively applies the mean value principle until you get within a small distance to the boundary and then you grab the boundary value. Um, surprisingly, this elegant algorithm hasn't been picked up much for applications but we'll use it as a starting point to estimate solutions to other fundamental PDEs as well. So in particular, uh, the Poisson equation, which is used for tasks such as surface reconstruction and shape editing, introduces an additional source term F. Um, the integral formulation of this equation actually generalizes the mean value property by convolving the source term with the harmonic Green's function of the ball. And actually this formulation applies pretty much directly to the screen Poisson equation as well. The only difference is in the Green's function that we use. From an algorithmic perspective, uh, for both of these PDEs, now we additionally pick up a random point inside the ball at each step, and we evaluate the source term times the Green's function, and then we add it to the Laplace estimate. We can also solve higher order PDEs by nesting lower order ones. So for example, the biharmonic equation can be decomposed into two second order PDEs that we can then solve using walk-on spheres. Um, and actually in the paper, we describe a more efficient technique that reuses walks between the nested and outer PDE. And personally, I'm very keen to see how to extend this approach to an arbitrary sequence of PDEs for more general optimization tasks. 
Finally, uh, we can also derive estimators for gradients of solutions to PDEs as well. And actually we show in the paper that they satisfy another mean value principle. And what's really nice here is that computing gradients is actually free of cost with walk-on spheres, because the only additional thing you need to do is to multiply your solution estimate with the outward normal to the first ball. It's also possible to uh, estimate higher order derivatives such as Hessians. Okay, so by now you've probably noticed that there are a lot of similarities between solving diffusive PDEs and doing rendering with Monte Carlo. So in place of ray tracing, now you're doing random walks. In place of ray intersections, you're doing closest point queries. But actually there's also significant overlap in how you do sampling, filtering, and removing noise. So for example, uh, techniques, for, uh, techniques for important sampling lights and materials and rendering can actually analogously be applied to sampling source terms and Green's functions and things such as the Poisson equation. In fact, we can actually simultaneously sample both the source term and the Green's function uh, in such equations using a technique from rendering called uh, multiple important sampling to bring down variance even further. Uh, control variates are another useful technique for reducing variance. And the basic idea here is that rather than summing up the integrand directly, you sum up the difference between the integrand and a function whose expected value is known. So in the paper, we provide some simple control variates for both the solution and gradient estimators computed with walk-on spheres. And actually we notice substantial various variance reduction for the derivatives. A separate technique to reduce noise is adaptive sampling. And here we take inspiration from rendering techniques such as radiance caching to concentrate sampling effort in regions with high frequency and then interpolate the solution. Finally, uh, deep learning based denoising is becoming increasingly popular in Monte Carlo rendering. And actually what we noticed is that you can often apply these techniques out of the box to second order PDEs as well. Though obviously you wanna train directly on PDE data to reduce bias. Okay. Finally, we evaluate our solver on examples with very complicated geometry, as well as applications such as vector field processing and deformation. And basically what we notice is that we inherit a lot of the usual benefits of Monte Carlo, but without any meshing or linear solves, right? And so as a result, we now have a new toolkit for solving PDEs, but with very different numerical trade-offs compared to FEM. And our hope is that just like rendering, you know, it started out simple and gradually added more amazing effects. We can do the same for geometry processing with the help of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. That was an amazing talk. We've already gotten a bunch of questions in the live chat and through other means, but uh, I think we'll, since we have a lot of them, we'll leave them for a joint Q and A at the end, uh, if that's okay with you. Um, before we move on to our headline speaker today, I'd like to remind you all that um, one of the cool things about doing this on YouTube is that we get to see statistics of who is watching us and what uh, makes people want to watch our talks. One of the things we notice is that a sizable amount of the views that we get come from being recommended on YouTube. Uh, when people are watching other computer graphics related videos and then they get recommended ours by the uh, YouTube algorithm, and one of the things that a YouTube algorithm takes into account when deciding whether to recommend something or not is how many people like it and how many people are subscribed to the channel. So this is my uh, way, nice way of saying that if you want to be notified every time we go live and you also want to help us in our mission to reach people that are outside of the, you know, the 10 computer graphics labs that hear about these things, we want to reach more people in the community then I encourage you to subscribe to our channel and like these videos and maybe go back and like one of the ones that you, of the previous sessions that we liked. Okay, without further ado, let's move on to our headliner speaker today. Uh, she is Professor Mirella Benchen, an associate professor at the Technion in Israel. It is impossible to summarize all of her achievements today since she has, she has contributed to vastly different areas of computer graphics, from animation to fluid simulation, geometric flows, meshing, and finally, shape analysis and shape, shape correspondence, on which I'm happy to say she will be speaking today. Apart from an incredibly prolific researcher, I have to say she's a professional and personal role model of mine. Uh, and she's a very good one of that too. Professor Benchen was based here in Toronto while on a sabbatical from the Technion before we all started working from home. And while she has gone back to Israel since then, I like to pretend that she's still here and we'll run into each other again while making coffee once we all go back to working in the lab. Let's give a very well, warm welcome to Professor Mirella Ben-Hen. You can take it away now. 
Thank you, Sylvia, for the amazing introduction. I also like to pretend that I'm in Toronto from now and then, especially for the awesome snow. So let me share my screen. And of course, the, uh, the nice community that you guys have there in the lab. Um, so first, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for the very nice uh, seminar series and for inviting me to speak. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about maps and connections, which I like to call uh, the cheat sheets of geometry. And before we start, I kind of uh, asked Sylvia to play a game with me. Uh, so the game goes as follows. Thank you, Sylvia, for agreeing <laughs> for the un unusual request. Um, <laughs> so the first player picks a number between one and nine. Then the second player picks another different number between one and nine. And then we repeat until one of the players has a subset sum of 15. So I'll okay. start. I'll be player A. OK, we'll do this with uh, text annotations. And I am going to pick uh, five. Uh, yeah. Did you see my five? Yeah. Sylvia, go ahead. What yeah. do you pick? I pick seven. You pick I assumed seven. I had to pick it before I saw yours, right? No, Otherwise. no, you can you can wait to see mine. <laughs> oh, you should okay. wait then to I'll see pick mine. 10. Oh, damn it. No, you can't pick 10. It's between one and nine. <laughs> OK, I'll pick nine. OK, okay nine. Uh, so you pick nine. So, yes. Baba? Sorry. OK, so now I'm going to pick uh, two. OK. Yes. I'll... Yeah. And you decide. Yeah, I'll pick three. Aha, uh -huh. so now I win because I can take eight. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. Ha, I killed your game. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> this was a bit unfair, and I'm going to explain now why. So let me uh, clear the drawings for now because I reached 15, right? This was the goal of the game to get 15. Right. Right. Um, so I cheated a bit, and un surprisingly. Um, wait. Yeah, so uh, let's look at what happened. So this is the game, right? These are the rules of the game. And let's look at the game a bit more closely for a second using some visual aid. So let's say that I put all the numbers between one and nine on this grid, and now I simulate the game, okay? And when I pick five, I put an X here. When I pick, it's a different game than me and me and Sylvia played. If I pick two, there's a zero and so on. There's an X, there's a zero. And this uh, so far should have reminded you of a very different game, which is tic-tac-toe. So essentially, there is an isomorphism between the game that I played with Sylvia, which is the number game. That means you have to pick a number between 1 and 9, and it accumulates until you end up with 15, and tic-tac-toe, which is a game that everyone knows. So in order to play the game, I actually had my, well, I don't know if you can see it. I was cheating. Yeah, I had a cheat sheet with the uh, small 3x3 uh, three three magic square that I used in order to know which numbers to pick, uh, because tic-tac-toe has a very well-known strategy. So essentially, you can show that there is a, a map F from the number game to tic-tac-toe and a map G back that uh, respects all the rules. OK, so all the rules that are described for the number game also uh, can be mapped to corresponding rules of tic-tac-toe. So what did we do here? Uh, we built uh, an isomorphism, right? So our source was tic-tac-toe, our target was the number game. And using this map, using this isomorphism, we learned how to win the game, OK? And this is uh, useful, for example, if you're doing uh, Zoom parties with friends, or hopefully when this thing is over, there's a vaccine, or happily at the lab, we can play this uh, uh, not on Zoom. Okay? So in general, this is the way mapping works in geometry and otherwise. You have a domain where you know what happens, you know the rules of the game. You have a different domain, which is new to you, and you don't know the rules, you don't know what to do. You compute a map from one to the second, and you carry over the rules that you already know. And this is how you... Uh, how you um, um, find new solutions and new algorithms. Okay, so maps are very um, useful in geometry and they basically uh, show up everywhere. Uh, they are used for transferring textures and data, uh, they are used for meshing, uh, they are used for representing uh, geometry for deep learning, which I had to put on a slide because somebody has to say deep learning in a mapping talk, but I'm not going to talk about today. Okay, and uh, it's also used in simulation. Okay, um, so let's start with something which is uh, kind of uh, well known, and this is maps between surfaces, which is also known as shape correspondence. I will specifically talk about uh, non isometric shape correspondence, which is one of the most challenging uh, settings of shape correspondence. And let's start with an example. 
okay? So uh, like many people in graphics, I'm very fond of the uh, Seagraph mugs and I try to collect one <laughs> every time I review a paper, which happens a lot. Um, so let's say I have a geometric representation of these two mugs. The problem of shape correspondence can be uh, described as follows. How can I compute pairs of points on the two shapes, which I know are in correspondence? So for example, these two orange points here. Or if I have, uh, in addition, I know the blue points and I know the green points. If I know all the points on all the shape, on both the shapes, then I can take any information from the first mug and transport it to the second mug. Okay, so now I go back in time and the 2018 Seagraph mug became the 2017 Seagraph mug. Okay, so what are the challenges in this type of uh, shape correspondence problem? Um, first, there are missing pieces, right? So a challenge that happens a lot is that you have uh, <laughs> uh, you have one shape which has pieces, let's say a tail usually or something that doesn't appear on the other shape, okay? In addition, you can have very different geometry. So uh, the handle of the cup that you see here is actually very different geometrically from the, cup, from the handle on the other side because this one is very flat and this one is very uh, thick. Yeah, but semantically, they uh, represent the same thing. In addition, you might have symmetries which contribute to some uh, uh, restrictions that you have on your map that the map has to uh, fulfill. So how do we go about compute this, computing these maps? So first, uh, let's uh, formulate this uh, using some uh, notation so we can talk about the restriction. So in my setup, I'll call the first cup or the first shape M1 and the second shape M2, okay? And I'm looking for um, I'm looking for maps phi12 and phi21 of M1 and M2, which uh, these two maps, if you apply them to the first shape, give you the second shape. Okay. So note that I have two. Okay. I have the map from M1 to M2, which I call phi12, and the map from M2 to M1, which I call phi21. Okay. So uh, this, now that I know what's the input and what's the output, I can go ahead and design an algorithm, okay? But the way I described the, the problem so far, it's, it's really uh, too general, right? So I can say, okay, M1 and M2 are these two nice models that I took from uh, Josh Holinati with his permission, amazing models, but I can't really map a dog to a mushroom, right? So even if you give this problem to a human, it's not clear what the output will be. Okay, so we have to assume that in addition to our M1 and M2, we have some additional information, okay, so that we can solve the problem. What kind of assumptions uh, can we do uh, regarding the problem? Often the assumption is that it's not a mushroom and a dog, okay, so what the, the first basic assumption is that the shapes are of the same class, so I have animals or cups or humans or so on. Uh, often this is not enough, and in addition, I should also uh, have some more specific geometric uh, information, for example, landmarks, okay? So what are landmarks? Landmarks are, I have uh, my two shapes and I have pairs of points on the shapes, which I know in advance they are in correspondence, okay? So this is part of the input to my problem in some case. Now, using landmarks or not using landmarks, this is, uh, it has advantages and disadvantages, okay? So the advantages, uh, that it's much easier to compute the map. In fact, if you think about it, the more landmarks that I have, the easier it is to compute the map. In the very uh, extreme case, if I have all the uh, information about all the vertices, then I already have the map, right? On the other hand, actually computing these landmarks, right? So somebody has to give them to you, is very um, uh, manually, it, it's done manually and therefore it's labor intensive, right? So uh, it's, uh, you have to uh, put a person to manually mark these landmarks for every pair of shapes that you have or for every class. And in addition, even if you find such a person, it's kind of difficult to do this accurately. So even the data sets that exist with landmarks, they often have um, mistakes. Yeah. Um, so in addition to these uh, uh, assumptions, we will also add some geometric assumptions. So uh, uh, one geometric assumption, which is often very useful is reversibility. What does reversibility mean? Let's say that I have my input shape M1 and my, the second shape M2, and now, <laughs> and, my in, and my maps phi12 and phi21, okay? Reversibility means that if I take the first point, the red point on M1, and I map it to the second shape M2 to get the blue point, 
if there's no additional information in terms of uh, uh, in, the, in terms of uh, landmarks or so on, I can't o o always say if this uh, point is a good point or not. But if I map it back using uh, phi to one, I can always say that I want the black point and the red point to be close to each other. Okay, so reversibility means mathematically that if I look at the composition of phi to one and phi one two, then I want this composition to be uh, to be the identity. Okay, to be as close as possible to the identity. Of course, uh, this is the same if I go from the other direction, right? So if I start from a point on M2, I go to M1 and then I go back to M2. Again, I want this to be similar to the identity. So now that I, I have the composition in the other direction should also be the identity. Uh, this is a special case of something called uh, cycle consistency. Okay, and these were both introduced a uh, long time ago, uh, not by me. Okay, so there are many papers that uh, discuss both reversibility, which I think was first done in the context of shape matching uh, for blended intrinsic maps by uh, Lipan et al and Kim. And uh, cycle consistency has then appeared later in many papers by uh, Gibbs and uh, Max and so on, Max of Genco. Uh, so what cycle consistency? If I have a series of shapes, okay, it's not just two shapes, but I have a bunch of them. Then if I go in a cycle mapping, kind of jumping from one shape to the other, I always want to come back to the same point when I start. So it's essentially, Essentially, it's the same as this constraint, but I have additional maps. Now, it's important to say that, for example, one of the challenges that I've shown before is that you are missing parts, right? Uh, so if, um, if you are missing a part of your shape, let's say this uh, second person didn't have a hand, then the map is not going to be bijective. And then cycle consistency is not appropriate. So uh, the only cases where you want to actually use reversibility, which is a very strong prior, is when you know in advance that you want the maps to be bijective. In fact, you can show, and it's a very simple proof, uh, that uh, if you assume reversibility in both directions, then this implies that the maps, both maps are one to one and on. Okay. So now we have our framework, right? I can go ahead and, and describe the algorithm. Um, we want to minimize some objective, which is uh, depends on phi one two and phi two one, um, and I have some assumptions. What assumptions? Let's say landmarks and reversibility. Okay, so I'm going to assume for the first uh, part that I'm I'm going to have landmarks. Okay, uh, but now I want to sit down and code the thing, right? But then I have this phi one two phi two one here, and what are they exactly? How do I represent them as variables, right? So here you run into head you you run into head first the problem. Uh, the main problem when working with uh, shapes, okay, with surfaces, and this is, you don't have canonical coordinates for surfaces, right? So you can say, yeah, all the X, Y, Z, all the points in R3 are on my surface. So this leads to problems of representation. Uh, the way we choose to handle it is to say that the, the image points, right, the points that we map are going to be represented using a face plus uh, barycentric coordinates, which is kind of, uh, you know, natural. So if I have a vertex i on M1, then and it is mapped to some point on a face on M2, then I'm going to represent this uh, uh, mapped point using the ID of the face, or uh, equivalently the, the indices of the three vertices JKL, and the biocentric coordinates WJ, WK, WL on that face. OK? Uh, this I can represent as a matrix. OK, so the map is actually going to be represented as a matrix P12, whose dimensions are V1 times V2, or V1 and V2 are the, the number of vertices in M1 and M2. And the i throw of the matrix is going to have the barycentric coordinates at these points. If the point PI, uh, the point I, sorry, the vertex I, is mapped to the triangle constructed of uh, the vertex JKL on M2. Now, this is a bit of a mouthful to explain every time I give a talk about maps, but this really makes a huge difference uh, when working with uh, map representations. Because if you just consider mapping vertices to vertices, you really don't get the nice smooth maths that I'm going to show later. So you really have to work with what uh, has been called in the literature precise maps, where you allow a vertex to move to a face. OK, so now we have a very specific uh, thing that we can refer to uh, in our objective. And this is the map representation, P12 and P21. So we have two matrices, OK? 
Uh, and this leads us to this um, uh, general framework of pointwise non-isometric reversible maps. Okay, so reversibility is very helpful in, in many settings. Um, so like we said, P12 and P21 are the optimization variables. Uh, we add additional information to enable non-isometry, for example, landmarks or symmetry and so on. We define the objective in terms of P12, P21 and the input geometry. And then we optimize simultaneously for P12 and P21. And this is again important because you want to keep everything symmetric and we've seen it again and again when working with uh, mapping problems that it's important to uh, walk in both directions. We couple everything through reversibility, okay? So we said P, uh, P1 to uh, compose with P1 should be close to the identity. And we solve this by alternating descent. So I'm not going into the kind of hairy details of the actual uh, uh, objectives uh, because it's it's a bit uh, a lot of notation but eventually all of these uh, uh, optimization problems boil down to fix p12 and solve for p21 then fix p21 and solve for p12 which is very similar to let's say local global approaches that are also very common in geometry processing now uh, what kind of geometric objectives do we want to use uh, this usually relates to the differential properties of the map. Okay, so the landmarks give me pointwise information. Symmetry gives me global information. And objectives, uh, the, the differential properties tell me how the map changes locally. Okay, so an objective which is very uh, popular is a harmonic objective. Harmonic basically means smooth or slowly varying. Okay, or you can look at it as every point goes to the center of the image of its neighbors which is again a mouthful so let's look at an uh, drawing okay at this uh, example so let's say i have a vertex u and it has a lot of neighbors okay this is on m1 everybody moves to points on m2 they don't have to be on vertices but the objective that we're optimizing is that the length of the edges okay which i represent as you know phi 1 2 of u minus phi 1 2 of v uh, is minimized okay so uh, harmonic maps are um, uh, represent I are identified okay a characteristic of harmonic maps is they they try to minimize edge lengths okay so they minimize the edge lengths on the target where we have some weights and these weights are derived from the source okay and this we described in the reversible harmonic maps paper another uh, type of objective that you can have which is a bit different uh, and kind of addresses one of the main uh, um, cons of this method is that it, because it aims for um, small edges, it tries to shrink things, okay? So if you think about it, if I set here phi one, two to be zero, right? So all the points move, uh, uh, not zero, but let's say a single point. Yeah, all the points move to the origin, then this energy is going to be zero, okay? And this is ge in general is not very, uh, is not a good idea uh, because, uh, you know, th it, it causes uh, the, the map to shrink. So elastic energy is a better uh, regularizer, okay? You can think of an elastic energy as an as rigid as possible energy. Basically, every point tries to kind of keep its neighborhood the same and move together with it. Uh, specifically, you can say that you want the edge lengths and the dihedral angles on the target to be as close as possible to the source. So if we look at the example of these two airplanes, this is a result of this uh, elastic correspondence uh, paper. You can see that the creases here are mapped to each other. So let me explain for a second what we, how do we visualize these maps because I didn't get into that yet. So what we do is we define a texture on the source shape, which is in this case is this one, yeah? Uh, and we uh, pull back this uh, texture to the other shape and this, tells us by looking at the texture, which points are in correspondence. So if I see, for example, the X here, it is in correspondence to the X here. And if I look at this line on the texture, it's going to be in correspondence with, with this line. So we can see from the texture correspondence that in fact, we are actually mapping the creases of the airplanes to each other, which is good. This is what we're trying to achieve uh, when we're using uh, an elastic correspondence. Okay. Uh, so again, I'm not going into all the details. If you're interested in, uh, you know, actually uh, looking into these, uh, first there's code available on my, my website, so you can download and play with it. And also you can uh, look at the papers. Um, just to kind of show off some results. So uh, RHM, the harmonic uh, correspondence, 
gives very smooth, uh, very smooth mapping results. Okay, so you can see, for example, that. Uh, first, the correspondence is uh, semantic, right? So the tail, the one, two, three here maps to the one, two, three here. So the tail is mapped to the tail. The head is mapped to the head. But you have some things are gliding, right? So let's say the edge of this wing doesn't exactly correspond to the edge of this wing. And this thing that you see here, this artifact is caused because of the, uh, you're actually seeing the texture from below, right? So what we're doing is we're basically projecting a texture and uh, when the map is not exactly, uh, is, is not perfect, then you see this texture uh, moving, okay? So RHM is, uh, we have this with the numbers here. It gives very nice smooth results. It can, uh, it allows the landmarks, the initial landmarks to move. Uh, and in some cases it can give uh, very good uh, maps. REM, uh, which here is represented with the, the letters, uh, is better, much better at keeping creases and actually uh, keeping the whole shape of the map. So this type of um, moving features, right? Well, the, some, one of the features kind of shifts and slips uh, around the, the, the edge doesn't happen. So here we map this giraffe to these three shapes, okay? And uh, you can see the line here that goes from the head of the giraffe to the leg, you can see it represented in all three shapes. And it's obvious that the map is, uh, uh, nice and uh, very uh, effective. Okay, this is also why we like to use uh, textures to demonstrate the maps and not just colors because then you can uh, actually see all the details. Okay, uh, just like a, a fun uh, fun fact, you can actually print these models, like fabricate them using 3D printing, which I like to do. Like when my PhDs graduate, I like to give them a, a you know a real uh, example of uh, the output of the algorithms. So these are the uh, results of the REM algorithm. I can see here the giraffe and uh, the cow and the horse. I think this guy didn't survive the 3D printing. I got it with his leg broken. Um, but anyway, you can also print map results. So these are the REM results IRL. Okay. Um, so we've seen RXM, right? RHM and REM. These are two schemes for non-isometric shape correspondence. RHM, like I said, uh, it gives very smooth results. It's robust. It can handle more difficult inputs, but it doesn't align creases. On the other hand, REM, it aligns creases, but it's more finicky, right, about its input. So the initial map has to be uh, something that you can compute the elastic energy for, right? So the elastic energy cannot blow up on the initial solution. Otherwise, our, optim our optimizer uh, dies. So Although we kind of fixed uh, some of the problems with the uh, elastic energy that uh, appeared in the literature, still it requires a clean initialization in order to work. So if you have to choose between RHM and REM, it really depends on, on the type of input that you have. Um, but uh, a downside is that they both require some additional information, some initial map or landmarks. Usually we use landmark. And the question is, uh, you know, we've seen the downsides of landmarks, right? Like uh, it's hard to mark accurately. There's a lot of manual labor involved and so on and so on. Can we automatically find the sparse landmark correspondence if we know that given the landmarks, we can find a good map, right? So now the question is, we have a very good algorithm for going from sparse to dense. Can we leverage it inside a bigger framework in order to solve the whole problem? Uh, and this we did in, uh, in CGRAPH this year uh, in a paper called Enigma, which is evolutionary non-isometric geometry matching. And in case you're curious, we first made up the name Enigma and then kind of made up the acronyms uh, to <laughs> tweak them to fit. Okay, so uh, for Enigma, you do auto landmarking. How does this work? Uh, like I said, the basic assumption is that I have some sparse correspondence and I have an excellent algorithm that does sparse to dense and gives me a dense correspondence. And then I use this as a black box, okay? And I feed it into a, a, a larger algorithm. So I'm minimizing over all the possible sparse correspondence. I'm trying to find the best sparse correspondence such that the dense correspondence is optimal under some objective F. Okay, and the objective can be harmonic or elastic is even better, whatever I, I uh, choose. Okay, uh, and this gives a fully automatic method because of this additional uh, argument that appears on, on, the, on the outside. 
this problem is combinatorial and highly nonlinear and non-convex and in general kind of a, a nightmare to optimize. So we use a genetic algorithm, which is commonly used for combinatorial optimization. And I'm really not going into the details of this because if you want to hear, then this is just a teaser for Michal Edelstein's talk on December 16th, which is uh, my student. <laughs> and she's the author of the paper, the main author of the paper. I'll just show off some, resu some results. Uh, so again, we visualize it is using the textures uh, and we can see that we get very good uh, texture correspondence. Yeah, we get very good maps, which are nice and smooth and map features, right? The face goes to the face uh, and so on. And this is fully automatic. Okay, so this needs no input, no training. There's a, you know, an executable, you give it to shapes and it gives you back a, a, a map. It, of course, it has, uh, you know, it has its downsides, right? So if you give it again, something which is not of the same class, for example, a dog and a mushroom, you will not get a good map. But if the shapes are of the same class, uh, then you're likely to get something nice. Okay. So uh, let's uh, do a very small, uh, uh, you know, summary for, for surfaces. We mapped, uh, when mapping surfaces, we map a source mesh to a target mesh, okay, mesh one to mesh two. And uh, what we gain from this is that we can transfer information. So for example, we can transfer uh, quad meshes, right? So let's say if this is my input surface and I'm mapping it to these three surfaces uh, and the input surface has a quad mesh built on top of it, which is also a, a, a non-trivial task, then I can use my correspondence to push forward uh, the quad mesh to the other surfaces and get Essentially, what you get here is a, a, a quad meshing, which is compatible between all these surfaces, which is also something which is difficult to achieve. In addition, you can transfer the formation. So if you combine our approach, which maps this source, this bird to the target bird, and essentially yields a compatible triangulation of both, you can combine this with an elastic um, interpolation method, e.g. by uh, Martin Ramf et al. Uh, and then you get a nice animation between the source and the target meshes. Of course, you can uh, use this for high resolution meshes. So we showed how to use, uh, how to generate map between subdivision surfaces, and then you can transfer details. Okay, so here you mapped uh, this person to this person, and uh, I drew the, you know, the, the, um, the bumps here, and you can map the bumps as a height function from the source to the target. And you can imagine in Blender, like you can edit when you have like a symmetry map, right? Like you edit one side of the shape and then it automatically ed edits the other. You can think about an application where you have two shapes and you can simultaneously add details on both. Let's say there are a pair of human and of, you know, male and female from some alien tribe or something. Uh, or if, if you have a de very detailed texture, okay? Like for this, uh, um, animal here, uh, then you, and you have a map that you computed between the subdivision surfaces, then again, you can map this uh, high, highly detailed surface to the other, highly detailed texture to the other mesh, okay? Or let's say, for example, you, you want a mesh with a nice texture, but you don't have a lot of money, then instead of paying $100 for this guy, uh, you pay $1 for this one, and you just transfer the texture. Uh, or you want to generate, okay, you, you walked a lot and you generated one animal and now you want to generate, to populate a family of tigers, then you can also use this approach. So this uh, mapping between surfaces is useful for content generation. So map, mapping between surfaces gets really a lot of publicity and many, many people use it. But I also want to talk a bit about uh, mapping between other types of uh, domains because there is what uh, to be gained by, by looking at this as well. So I want to look at uh, my second part about maps between uh, planar domains, which is uh, used for 2D animation. <coughs> okay, so let's start with an example again. Let's say that I get as input this nice flower here. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to change its boundary to be nice and symmetric, like the boundary of this, uh, you know, clip out uh, flower. Note that I'm not uh, looking at the interior, just as the, at the boundary. Then I can do something like this. Okay, I want the output to be something like this, where note that the interior almost doesn't change, but the boundary has been modified to this target boundary, and you have a very uh, smooth and uh, almost seamless uh, deformation from here to here. Okay, 
There are some uh, artifacts, it's not perfect, but in general, it looks okay. So how do you go about doing that? So let's define the problem mathematically like we did before. We have a domain S, okay, a planar domain. And we have the boundary of the target domain, okay, T. And we are looking for a map phi from S to T. Okay, so first uh, we are essentially going to map the boundary. And then the uh, mapping of the boundary implies the mapping of the interior. Okay, so note that in advance, we're not saying which point on the boundary of S goes to which point on the boundary of T. Okay, so the, actually the domain can slide on top of the boundary of T. Now we're not, not looking at general maps. We're only looking at angle preserving maps. Okay, so angle preserving means that if I take two curves on the source domain and I look at their image on the target domain, then their angle is preserved. Okay, so in this case, all these quads are mapped, like all the angles are 90 degrees, they're going to stay 90 degrees angles on the target domain. And the way the angle between two curves is defined is uh, as the angle between the tangent, tangent uh, vectors at the intersection. Okay. So uh, when you're working with uh, planar domains, it's very nice and very useful to work with uh, complex variables. So basically here you identify the complex plane uh, with R2. So any point uh, uh, Z in R2, you look at it as a complex number, okay? And then the output, the map that I'm looking for is a function, a complex function F from my target domain S to my, do from my source domain S to my target domain T, okay? So now everything is complex numbers, S and T and that. Um, and there is a very nice relationship between maps in the complex plane and complex function, maps in, in the uh, maps in the plane and complex function, which is that phi is an angle preserving map, if and only if f the complex function is holomorphic. So I really am not going to go into the whole complex variables course of what is a holomorphic function, but just to kind of give the gist of things, a holomorphic function is complex differentiable. So you take the usual definition of the derivative that you know and love from calculus, yeah and you put in complex numbers instead of real numbers, okay? And this makes big, a big difference. First, you have here the division of two complex numbers, which is already weird. But in addition, you, have, you need this, uh, this limit to exist, no matter from which direction you approach your point Z0, okay? So uh, holomorphic functions are a restricted set of complex functions. But we like them because they are linearly spanned by boundary basis functions, okay? So uh, any uh, holomorphic function fulfills the Cauchy integral formula, which means that if I have my source domain S, I look at the point Z, okay? Now I take another point W on the boundary of the domain, then every such, uh, every such point W has a corresponding function, complex function, complex basis function, which uh, uh, matches it, right? Now I take the result of this function, I multiply it by some f of w, right? And I repeat this for all the points w on the boundary of my domain, okay? So the Cauchy integral formula tells me that if I do this, I will get the value of the uh, f of z, okay? So essentially, if you kind of squint at it and ignore the integral and think of it as a sum, this is a linear interpolation, okay? A linear, uh, uh, a linear sum where you weigh all the uh, targets of every point on the boundary with some basis function, which depends only on the boundary point and the interior point that you're working with. Now, this is uh, very similar, if not identical to boundary element methods. It's just much, much nicer formulated in complex numbers in the plane. It's much cleaner, <coughs> sorry, okay? Uh, and this leads to a simple and uh, kind of uh, easy algorithm. Uh, basically, you want on the one hand to have a conformal map from S to T, but you want to prescribe the boundary. And this usually is in conflict. These two uh, demands are in conflict with one another because while there exists a, a conformal map between any two domains in the plane, yeah, you cannot uh, prescribe the boundary in advance and hope that given this boundary prescription, this conformal map exists. Okay, so it's a delicate, uh, this is why you have to allow the boundary to slide. It's a delicate uh, point. So what do we do? Uh, essentially, we uh, define 
an objective yeah, by sampling the boundary. Here in C, you have a discretization of all the basis functions that I've shown before. And F hat is uh, the discretization of F, the, the, the function, the mapping function. OK, so now F is just a vector. And I'm optimizing both for F and W, where W is the point on my target boundary. OK, so I'm optimizing both for the mapping coefficients F and the correspondence point W. And as is the usual theme <laughs> throughout this talk, I do this using alternating descent, okay? So I, <coughs> uh, in the global step, I fix W and I just solve for the best um, conformal map, yeah, by uh, optimizing W. So I just have a quadratic expression in uh, complex numbers, which is uh, trivial to solve. In the local step, I fix my complex map and I'm just changing the uh, W, which are the projecting projection points, okay? So if I run this again, you start from some correspondence and this iteratively converges to a, a map that you want, which is put, putting all the, which is a map between S and T, which was prescribed, the boundary T was prescribed and it is conformal, okay? Um, so now what did we do? We had a planar domain S and a target, a plane, uh, the source was a planar domain S, the target was a planar domain T. And uh, we learned how to, for example, transfer textures, okay, or do animation or do 2D deformation. And there are extensions, you can use this, uh, for example, to, instead of prescribing the boundary, you can prescribe some points in the interior, yeah, like do point to point uh, shape deformation or stroke to stroke, you can even prescribe a whole line and you integrate over the line to get that. And you can generalize the surfaces, for example, by mapping uh, a surface to the plane using some existing conformal map approach, for example, uh, Rohan's BFF, which was mentioned here before, or uh, metric scaling or any other conformal map that you want, and then mapping between the resulting planar domains. Okay, and this was useful. This is useful for shape deformation and animation. This is the straightforward way to look at uh, planar maps. Okay, but if you go back to the uh, tic tac toe example from the beginning, there's another way to look at this. Okay, essentially, we are mapping map representations. Okay. We wanted to work with planar conformal maps, but instead we were working with holomorphic functions, okay, which are not, which is a different thing, but there is an isomorphism between them. To, to some, there are some, you know, small asterisks uh, that the mathemat mathematicians will tell you, but essentially these are very similar objects, okay. What we gained is a way to compute fast maps using a very easy uh, optimization, right? Because for holomorphic function, we have this uh, basis of functions that we can work in its space to do the optimization. Unlike what we had to suffer through for surfaces where we had to explicitly uh, work with points on the, like represent them using uh, points on the triangles. Uh, and additionally, as often happens in this game where you take one domain and you map it to a different domain, is that uh, this very similar machinery can be applied to simulate Healy Shaw flows, which looks like a completely different application, but it's actually very similar because there as well, you can use conformal maps because you want to compute a harmonic function. So I'm not going to go into the, you know, the physical uh, setup, but in general, if you think about taking uh, two plates, yeah, and injecting, uh, which have some sort of viscous fluid inside and injecting, let's say ink, okay? Then the ink behaves in very specific ways, right? Like you inject some material and the material kind of expands. And people, uh, artists use this to generate very uh, amazing um, photographs, okay? So they do the experiment and they take the photograph. So what we did in this, uh, uh, in this example is we took the boundary of the output that uh, Anthony Hall generated and we ran our optimization to kind of continue, uh, continue the experiment virtually. Yeah, continue it by simulation. And you can see that you get very similar patterns to the one you began with, okay? So again, in order to make this happen, the actual optimization uses exactly the same machinery that we used for uh, doing the planar map using uh, complex functions, okay? And you can also use this, you can also use this in the context of, uh, you know, uh, computer graphics, so you can have a bunny, of course there has to be a bunny kind of blowing up, or you can have a suction point that kind of pulls in the fluid, and since everything is very fast, you can do it interactively, so you can move uh, the initial conditions of your uh, physical system while the simulation is running and kind of pull in uh, 
the, this non-appetizing, making a non-appetizing apple. Or if you additionally to, instead of just showing the boundary, you show the how the whole interior uh, changes by uh, mapping the texture with, uh, while running the Healy show flow, you get this kind of animations. I'm not sure what it's useful for, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> okay. Um, and amusingly, this is a special case of something which I think has been talked about quite a lot and I'm actually not going into today. And this is uh, uh, map representations for surface to surface maps uh, as linear operators or matrices or functional maps. And this is basically very similar, right? So you take something which is surface to surface maps like we had the planar to planar maps. And instead of representing them as maps, you represent them as linear operator. Okay, and what you gain is exactly the same. You can compute maps easily using a fast optimization, and this is useful anywhere where maps are used. Okay, so of course it, you get to see these things, you know, when you zoom out and and you look at the stuff that you did, right? So when when you know when someone comes to you and says, oh yeah, I know how to do uh, maps very easily, and I have this uh, great idea, I'm, uh, Max, right, with uh, function maps, you never think about the connections to 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 other things. But when you zoom out and you see that there is a very similar trend that goes through things and which is uh, mapping between domains to, to gain information. Okay, uh, the last bit is uh, mapping from a surface to a generalized plane. And this is boundarization and meshing because now we know how to map between surface to surface and we know how to map from plane to a plane. So we can also do a hybrid and map from a surface to a plane. Uh, I'm really going to skim this. Uh, the input here is a triangle mesh and uh, optionally, you also have some additional information such as a symmetry function. And the output is a remeshing of your surface uh, using quads or um, uh, hexagons or triangles, but you want this to be a semi-regular remeshing, okay? So the degree of all the vertices should be uh, four if it's quads or three if it's hexagons or six if it's triangles, okay? And then you can do nice things like, uh, you know, if you get a very low resolution uh, quad mesh and then make it uh, 3D printed using very thin uh, uh, edges uh, or actually mesh the thing using some, uh, uh, you know, mesh, <laughs> like real mesh. Um, here, the constraint is that all the edge lengths have to be one and then you can really uh, realize it in the real world. And I think this chair was actually printed for me by Derek. So thank you, Derek. <laughs> okay, when I visited Toronto in, um, there's a nice analogy between uh, meshing and surface maps, which I'll, uh, I, I want to mention, is that uh, surface maps, you have the connectivity, right? And you're looking for a new geometry. So if you think of M1 and M2, you have the connectivity of M1, and you're looking for a new geometry, which looks exactly like M2. And for meshing, you have the geometry, and you're looking for a new regular connectivity. So it's possible that you can actually kind of uh, find additional analogs between these two applications. In general, in order to do meshing, what you do is you draw a grid, okay? So if we go back to this shape that I've shown earlier, you can map it to the plane using PFF or CPMS or whatever your, your favorite conformal map. Uh, then you can use ICCM, the algorithm that I've shown previously to map between these two planar domains and kind of lift the grid that you have on the plane to the surface. Now, this is a very uh, idealized view of uh, meshing because uh, the grid is perfect, right? And often, and this means the mesh will be regular, but often you actually have to have uh, irregular vertices. And in order to do that, to have generalized grids, uh, then you have to um, uh, kind of have, allow for cuts, okay? So the irregular vertices, let's say on the nose of the kitten here, is mapped to kind of a, a, a vertex at the, uh, <coughs> sorry, at the corner. And then this uh, line will be um, doubled, right? So essentially you have to think about it like you're zipping the, the two uh, directions to get this uh, nice kitten. Um, how do we do the gridding? Essentially, the, the idea is the same. You have to figure out what are the variances that you need and then build a representation that respect this invariance. Okay, so it has to be invariant to translation. You're gonna use a vector field, which is a differential representation. Uh, you wanna be invariant to rotations by two pi. Then you look at an angle with a fixed direction, okay? Uh, if you want to be invariant, actually a grid 
uh, quad grid has a rot uh, rotation by pi over two invariants, and then you have to be invariant uh, to a fixed uh, direction, uh, to the angle with a fixed direction multiplied by four, and so on and so on. If you have symmetry, you can modify this paradigm to get a representation which is invariant to the symmetry, okay? Uh, <coughs> and then you can get a very nice uh, uh, symmetric quad meshes. And uh, the cool thing here is that if you have, uh, we've, sh we've shown this in Seagraph 2017, if you have uh, uh, the symmetry line going through the uh, back of the bunny here, then uh, you can show mathematically that the quads have to be either aligned. It has been shown before us that the quads have to be either parallel to the symmetry line or at 45 degrees. And the nice thing about this approach is that it automatically finds the location of the singularities such that you get the best possible um, uh, kind of uh, quadding where you either have parallel or um, map to 45 degrees. OK. Um, so when we map grids, we have a surface. We map it to a generalized plane. Uh, what we learned is we, lift, we can lift grids to do meshing. Uh, and then you can build things like stents and, you know, very important applications like wrapping fruit. Uh, this is actually a rendering. Uh, and you can also do uh, plenary meshing with hexagons and kind of uh, say hi to your favorite university, which is not your own. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is work in progress. This is why the rendering is kind of crappy. Uh, and meshing is useful in fabrication and simulation and modeling. So to conclude, uh, I've shown three examples where maps are useful, uh, and you can use them as a cheat sheet. In any case, when you transport a problem to a different domain, for example, using complex numbers or using matrices or using a flat domain or generalized flat domain, uh, while preserving the invariances, so the invariances are important, this leads to uh, new algorithms and new insights and new proofs. And even though these things look like they are the same, by looking at them from different directions, you actually gain something. And I'd like to finish with a quote from uh, Henri Poincaré, who said that mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. Uh, thank you. These are my collaborators, or the names behind the letters, which gave their sweat and effort and brains for these papers. And these are the guys that gave the money. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, you said um, very ambiguously your favorite university, which is not your own, which can mean that your favorite university is not your own or that, that, that ah, it is no, your no, no, favorite no, no. university outside of your own. So I, You're I, getting I think me in trouble. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah let's, leave it, let's leave it in the ambiguity. Uh, no, no, the second one. I'll get fired. No, <laughs> so if, if you could please uh, stop sharing your screen so that we can move on to oh, our yeah. Q&A. Um, yeah. Fortunately, both our speakers agreed beforehand to go a little over time. We didn't know we would be going that much over time. But, oh, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> we, yeah. we still have a lot of very interesting questions from the chat, and we'll start with one for Rohan so that Mary can get a glass of water or something. Uh, and this is a question by someone called EV77S4F, which I want to mention because this person asks, asks a lot of questions and makes our Q&A sessions much, much nicer every week. And yet, we don't know your name to give you any credit for it. You, if you prefer to keep asking questions anonymously, that's perfectly fine by us. But if you also want to tell us your name, we'd love to say it because you make our Q&A sessions much more interesting. Anyway, the question is, how might this idea be extended to other, uh, in particular, nonlinear elliptic PDEs? Is there a generalization of Wacom spheres to other operators? Yeah, right. So, so what I'd say is that in this paper, right, we only considered Brownian random walks. Um, and if you open a book on stochastic calculus, right, Brownian motion is kind of sort of the first thing you learn. It's a very rich subject, but it's also sort of the simplest stochastic process that you consider first. And stochastic calculus is really a field about studying stochastic processes, even things other than Brownian motion. So things like Poisson processes and stuff like that. And sort of, you know, studying their expect, expected values and relating them to PDEs. So sort of the game over here is uh, you, rather than studying the PDE directly, you study stochastic processes and you relate them to the PDEs that they correspond to. So, you know, when you start thinking about nonlinear elliptic PDEs, then you have things like branching Brownian motions that start generalizing the framework that we already have. Okay, thank you. I think that, uh... 
a satisfying answer. Our next question is for Miri. I mean, Professor Van Chen, is there a way to extend reversibility uh, to partial maps instead of total maps, as you show in the talk? For instance, um, how about augmenting each mesh with a dead region that's mapped to when there's no corresponding geometry between the two shapes? That's an excellent idea. Yeah, or you can think about, uh, uh, you know, uh, segmentation where you kind of say, okay, I have reversibility, but this part goes to that part. Yeah, or like a multi-resolution uh, representation of reversibility. Yeah, you can do lots of things, which are very cool uh, with this. So nice idea. Is this uh, the same guy? Question, <laughs> it is the same person, yeah. Uh, <laughs> our next question is by Odette Stein. And uh, for some reason, the, the automatic YouTube moderation decided this was an offensive comment and they deleted <laughs> it immediately. So this is an, a good example of what uh, you said at the beginning of the talk of not doing deep learning. And this is why you don't <laughs> do machine learning. So this is the question and please uh, feel free to suggest what is it about this question that was offensive to YouTube <laughs> moderation. Uh, so he asks, how do you characterize the boundary between the surface classes? So a dog is not a mushroom, we agree on that, but how much do you need to deform a mushroom for it to become, to be in the class of dogs? I think I, I think this actually is a question that machine learning can answer, right? So if if you train a, a, a network or you ask a person, uh, are these two the same, or can you think about the correspondence between them? Uh, best thing is to ask your kid, a kid, yeah. So what what, what how will sh how should the correspondence look? Then uh, you can feed it to an algorithm. But if a person cannot tell you that uh, you know this is a chair and this is a banana and there's not nothing going to happen between them, then you know. So I think the answer is it has to be uh, supervised. Okay, that's good. Um, so the next question for Rohan is uh, from me actually. I forgot I wrote this. Um, so uh, when when we first watched your secret presentation a few months ago, I remember someone. I won't say their name saying, is finite element dead for now on? Uh, and I started thinking back to like all the times I've used uh, Alapash in, in my previous projects. And uh, one thing I'm not clear about is, can you introduce linear equality, general linear equality constraints to your problem? So you can, I see how you add the boundary condition by imposing it when you're very close to the boundary. That seems like a little different to the traditional formulation where the boundary condition is just a linear equality constraint that you impose in a quadratic program. So um, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, so it's 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 an interesting question. And I guess I, I'd first say, okay, how do we do this in FEM, right? So when you're doing FEM, generally what you do is um, you write out some energy or some PDE, right? And you want to subject it to to some constraints, you apply it, Lagrange multipliers, and then you sort of minimize it, right? But when you're actually doing FEM, you don't need to explicitly minimize the energy, right? You just, uh, sorry, minimize the energy with respect to the constraints, you minimize just the energy. And then when you have your matrix, you kind of append those linear equality constraints, right? So you discretize the energy first then apply the constraints. In a Monte Carlo setting, now you're working, um, you know, in, there's no discretization. Right, so what you need to do now is kind of work slightly differently. So you can imagine writing out your um, energy subject with Lagrange multipliers, actually minimizing it, seeing what PDE you get at the end of the day, and then start talking about how do I actually simulate this using some Monte Carlo procedure. So just to say again, I think walk on spheres isn't the only Monte Carlo algorithm that exists for second order equations, right? Uh, there are like rendering the scope for more Monte Carlo algorithms. But you have to kind of study the PD that you're thinking about and then talk about, uh, you know, derive it and then say, how do I simulate this using Monte Carlo? So that's sort of the, the recipe and the game is sort of different. Okay, I like that answer because it's basically saying, you do the research. Uh, <laughs> there, there should be uh, a, a Monte Carlo type method that does that. Right, uh, okay, I, our next question. I, 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 I would also just quickly add one more thing, right? So one, one way of going about this is deriving the PDE. The other thing you can ask is, okay, I can iteratively minimize an energy, right? But I know how to solve simple PDEs like we discussed in the paper. If I can iteratively solve them, kind of like with the biharmonic equation, right? Then I can minimize that energy and satisfy the constraints. Okay, 
Um, so that's sort of maybe another line of attack. But I should say, like, um, there's no definitive answer that I'm giving right now because this is all very new. I see, and that's the exciting part, I think. Uh, okay, thank you. So our next question is for Mary. Uh, since the elastic energy penalizes scaling, will it have difficulty in handling missing parts, like in the example with the two mugs that you showed, when you want to map a big region on M1 to a very small region in M2 or vice versa? Yes. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I said, none of these methods are perfect, right? So for every one of the methods that I've shown, for every algorithm, you can find a counterexample for which other methods will work better. So if you have less regularization, you allow for things to shrink. Right, for harmonic, for example, wouldn't have trouble with this. It will allow for things for things to shrink. But if you allow for things to shrink, then in some cases where you don't want them to shrink, they will shrink. Right. So you can think about the hybrid. Maybe you, you know you you specify the regions where you want to say this is harmonic and this is elastic, or think of something like that. Yeah. But nobody. That, that's actually a very good segue into our next question, which is why not combine them? Why do we have to make a discrete choice and like if, whether we want it to be elastic or whether we want it to be uh, harmonic. That's also, yeah, I think this should be pretty easy to try, you know, like uh, set up some alpha and kind of just add both energies and, uh, uh, you know, maybe learn the parameter based on some data. Um, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. Uh, our next question is from Rohan. Is it easier or harder to differentiate your method than it is to differentiate finite element method? So for inverse design problems, like move inverse is to minimize a lot. Um, I guess, again, there's no, I, I can't give a definitive answer. I would say it's probably in this case, uh, very application dependent, right? So both, uh, doing differentiation in a Monte Carlo framework, as well as FEM is kind of an active area of research, but I would say, especially with Monte Carlo, you know, there's a lot of inspiration to take, uh, from inverse rendering, which is very active and very hot right now. Um, where you know they're optimizing scene geometry, scene colors, scene material properties with respect to the output image, right? And they're even doing sort of shape optimization while optimizing the final image, which is quite amazing. We're moving vertices around of the scene geometry. So I would, you know, it's it's the the answer is that uh, probably it's an active area of research. So there's no de definitive answer, and it depends on the application. But what's exciting is that they're different trade-offs uh, with both approaches. With Monte Carlo, you'll have variance in your gradient, gradient estimates. With FEM, probably what you'll have is, as say you're, I don't know, optimizing material properties in an elastic deformation, the mesh quality might worsen. So you have to think about how to deal with that. So it, it's, a, it's a game of trade-offs, right? Different numerical toolkits. Okay. That, that, again, that's a very exciting answer because it leads you to maybe inspire someone to do their own project. So that, that's the, the goal of this talk, so that's good. Uh, our next question for Mary, and I know you only did a teaser, so you can leave <laughs> the, this person to ask the question to Michal when the time comes, but what happens if Enigma is given to non-homeomorphic surfaces? Ah, uh, aha, uh -huh. you can do that. Like, let's say if there are surfaces with different genus, right? Yes. So they're not homeomorphic. I'll just say that, uh, <laughs> It will give you the best that it can, right? So it will try to minimize the energy. Uh, but of course, since there's no homeomorphism, you wouldn't get a bijection, right? And I'll leave the details to Michal and I'll let her know to be prepared for the question. Okay, okay, yeah. I'll ask it. Uh, okay, to end, because we've gone a lot over time, let's uh, ask a question to both, uh, which is, uh, you know, we have this tradition of trying to bridge both talks together to get a common question for both. We're gonna try and do it this time too. Um, so let's start with Rohan. Uh, Miri's harmonic mapping is obviously a, a involves the, the Laplacian, which you talked about in your talk. So how straightforward is it to apply your Monte Carlo method to um, shape correspondence? So if you're particularly solving for a harmonic map in volumetric domains, you can already do it. When it comes to solving problems on 2D manifolds, uh, this is an interesting, again, area of future research because you need to simulate stochastic processes on 2D manifolds, right? Um, 
So, but but there are stochastic simulations on graphs, so that might be absolutely helpful. right. Yeah, so if you're already working with a mesh representation, then you can already do that. In fact, the CPMS paper that Mary was talking about takes inspiration from this idea of random walks on graphs. Yeah, you get points. Yeah, that's a great answer. Uh, by the way, some people are asking in the chat if there will be a talk in this seminar series specifically about the Enigma method. And we are very happy to say yes. So on <laughs> December 16, you can tune in to hear Michala Delstein uh, talk about her paper. Okay, so same question for you, Miri. How could we use Rohan's Monte Carlo method to your mapping problem? Yeah, so, you know, he answered it. Uh, basically, you need to take the the uh, the place where you optimize. So how does the Laplacian come in? You have the cotangent weights, right? So if you want to do this, let's say, instead of mapping surfaces, you want to map point clouds or bad surfaces or, poly or you know, uh, polygon soups, right? Then uh, you'll need to compute the Laplacian on this polygon soup, and then you'll have to use uh, Rohan's approach. So I think this is actually possible, yeah, even maybe plausible uh to try yeah okay thank you uh so that's uh a wrap for today oh, wow. uh, we'd like to end by <laughs> thanking both of our speakers and also our artist yanni lo who designed this week's poster and we also want to encourage you all to tune in next wednesday at 1 p.m eastern time uh to hear from adriana schultz and our very own hong ling chen uh, thank you very uh, thank you all very much for coming and see you next week Bye, guys. Thanks.